While we sit in the car staring out at the silent house, Balkis goes on to tell a tragic story about two young, seemingly normal people caught up in some extraordinary historical circumstances when the box they occupied in Ford's theater was invaded by John Wilkes Booth, the tall, handsome, fiercely Southern Confederate actor who put the barrel of a derringer to Lincoln's head and pulled the trigger, changing the course of American, if not world, history forever. You see, Mr. Baker, the professor goes on, the moment Booth burst into the box, Henry Rathbone tried to save his president by leaping towards the killer's gun. My guess is he would have gladly taken the bullet himself. But he was just too far away, and Booth was able to complete his grisly deed. However, that didn't stop Henry from apprehending the killer. But Booth was packing a fighting knife with an eight-inch blade, and he managed to cut Henry's arm so badly he nearly bled out on the spot. So what's this house got to do with what you're telling me? Although Clara and Henry settled in Washington, D.C. after they were married, this home is where they came to live during the hot summer months since it was close to Clara's father, who worked in the New York State Senate. Among the personal articles they brought with them into the marriage and into this house were the white dress that Clara wore on that fateful night, a dress that was stained with both her husband's blood and the blood from the president. They also brought with them the derringer that killed Lincoln and the fighting knife that cut Henry's arm. Then, as the story goes... Christmas of 1893, while they were living at the summer house for the holidays, Henry went into a rage, believing not only that Clara was having an affair, but that she was doing so out of shame for his having failed to save the president. He runs across the stony bottom of the now dry lake bed until he comes to the cavern-like entrance. Leaning over, he peers down into the abyss. Cool, rich, sweetly organic-smelling air emerges from the depths. But what of my sheep? he asks himself aloud. Father is all alone, and he is depending upon me. But what harm can come from exploring this massive opening in the earth, even if only for a few moments, to see what secrets it holds? That's when it comes to him. The flying object. Maybe this cave was its destination all along. Maybe the cave is a home for whoever, or whatever, flies inside the machine. Moving to the edge of the cave, he stumbles, loses his balance, his right foot pushing a loose stone over the edge so that it falls into the opening. The stone lands, coming into contact with what sounds like a pool of water. The sound of the splash resonates up and out of the cave's mouth. Sitting down, he hangs his legs over the opening. Then, rolling onto his stomach, he gradually lowers himself into the hole, his feet searching desperately for a foothold. When he finds one, he realizes happily that he will be able to climb down into the cave using only his hands and feet. Slowly, he descends into the cave, his hands gripping the stone outcroppings, his feet balancing on the small, narrow, stair-tread-like ledges, until, finally, he finds himself standing on the cave floor, only the light from the midday sun illuminating him. You want me to go after seven books made of metal, they were written, or in this case minted, back in the year 70 AD. Each book is sealed, or was sealed at one time or another, but now that six are no longer sealed, there must be four riders out there riding four horses, one of whom is a pale rider on a pale horse. I think he used to do bong hits to a Led Zeppelin song like that down in some kid's basement back when I was in high school. Not exactly, Cross says. The horse is a metaphor. According to the Bible, the only known entity to have the power to breach the seventh seal on the seventh book is something not of this earth. And what would that be? The Messiah, the man guide you and I both know as Jesus of Nazareth. Another wave of silence shrouds the room for a moment. Listen, Chase. Magda jumps in after a time. More than likely, the seals are just a bedtime story created by the author of the book of Revelations. John of Patmos, I say, or John the Divine. But that doesn't make them any less powerful to the believer, Cross adds, especially the seventh seal. To some believers, breaking the seal means the heavens will rain down destruction on the earth. How so? Legend and the Bible has it that once the seventh seal is opened, there will be events summoned by seven trumpets that will bring unbelievable devastation to our planet. Volcanoes will erupt, forests will burn, the earth will split open. Tombs and graves will open up. Oceans will boil. Meteors will rain down from heaven and bombard the earth. 